Thank you for joining us today. Today we're going to be talking about the SAMR model and the four C's and how they are integrated together and how you can integrate them into your classroom, both during distance learning and when we get back into our brick and mortar classrooms. So just to kind of go over the agenda for today, we're gonna to talk about uh, what is the SAMR model and then we're going to talk about focus on learning we're gonna give you some examples. We're also going to cover the four C's and what they are, give you some examples of what that would look like in the classroom. And then at the end, we're going to share some resources with you all. So the SAMR model is basically just a ladder that as you move up, you're moving up through the four stages. And it provides a way to look at how technology tools impact teaching and learning. So this model focuses on the learning that's taken place and not the actual tech tools. And so there's different parts of the SAMR model. There's the enhancement, which starts at the beginning rungs of the ladder. And then as you climb the ladder, you get into the transformation phase of how you're using these technology tools in your classroom. And so we'll get into the nitty gritty of all of these steps. And then the SAMR model was developed by Dr. Rubin, and I'm just gonna call him Dr. Rubin because I, I don't wanna mess up his last name, but um, it was developed by him and it's a model that like Sitara said, it's, it's a model that demonstrates progressive tech integration into lessons based on the teaching and learning, not based on the tech tool. So it's not trying to figure out how we can make this tech tool fit into our lessons, it's based on the lessons and how the tech can enhance those lessons. It's more about how the tool or app is being used itself, not the tool itself. So it's about how this tech tool can help enhance and support our lessons. And so when we talk about just the SAMR model design, it's basically like four goals. So the first goal is to just help educators integrate technology into instruction as learning tools. So you're not using the technology tool just for fun. You're using it to enhance the learning. Another reason for the SAMR model is to help understand the levels of rigor that are involved into integrating the tech. So as you keep integrating the technology at different levels, the rigor should increase. Also building capacity and understanding to successfully implement the tech into instruction and then being able to reflect on the use of your technology to make sure that you're enhancing the student thinking and student choice and the students asking questions where you're getting into that transformation type of learning. And so here is another kind of visual that shows what the SAMR model looks like. So there's four stages, okay? And we want to continuously, they call it like rungs of a ladder. We wanna continuously be moving up those rungs of the ladder. So it's important to look at these and um, think about the level of student engagement and talking about um, how that tech tool can enhance the engagement, not worrying about the tech tool itself. So when we are looking at this, okay, we're gonna start off at the bottom, which is substitution. So the tech acts as a direct substitute. So that could be something like instead of having them write an essay on a piece of paper, you're having them type it out in a Google Doc. There's no real functional change there, it's just a direct substitute. And then as you go up, you're going to kind of have some more tech enhancements and then you're gonna get into that transformation center. So next would be the augmentation. So tech acts as a direct tool with some functional improvements. So maybe you're having them type out that essay, but now you're having them you know, provide feedback and they're adding comments and things like that. Um, some modification. So this would allow for significant task redesign. So maybe they are working on a writing assignment, but maybe instead of it's just them working by themselves, they're working on it collaboratively. And maybe they're working on it collaboratively with students from another school or at another site or something. Something that that tech is gonna allow for a significant redesign. And then when you get to the top, when you get into redefinition, it's gonna be something that the tech allows for the creation of a new task that was previously inconceivable. So it's something that they could do that would not be possible if they did not have the tech. So maybe instead of writing their essay, maybe they are going to create a movie or they're gonna create a video or they're gonna record a podcast, something like that. That's, it's something that they could not do 
without the tech. So it's kind of, as you can see, like as you move up, the, um, the rigor kind of in increases, the engagement increases, but it's all based around the lesson and the um, engagement is not based around the, the tech itself. It's all about how that tech can enhance our lessons. And so if we just start at the lowest essential rung of the ladder and we look at substitution, this is where technology is acting as a direct substitute. So you're doing the same task as before. It's essentially just the same old, same old. Work can be completed without the use of technology. So if you're typing essays instead of writing it or filling in a worksheet on a PDF instead of filling it in on paper. So it's the exact same thing. You're just taking a computer and instead of using a pencil and paper, you're doing the computer and you're doing the same exact task. So the students aren't doing any type of creative thinking. They're not, there's no extra rigor in there created by integrating that technology. So it's just the same old, same old, just as using a tech tool. Next, we get into the augmentation. So like we talked about, technology offers um, is, is an effective tool to perform a common task. There are some improvements to it. So work requires the technology. So, so, so students are maybe collecting data for uh, information for a research project that they're doing. Maybe it, they start an online um, communication or collaboration with someone. Maybe they're taking a Google form quiz, something like that. So it's, it offers an effective, it's an effective tool, um, but the tech is required to kind of do that specific task when you're in the augmentation section of the SAMR model. And then it makes, the tech is making it better and easier. And so when we look at modification, modification, we're now getting into that transformation stage of the SAMR model. And so with modification, the technology allows for significant task redesign. That means that it's enhancing the learning that's already taking place. So you have your students starting to get into being creative and critical thinking. This could be an audio recording of an essay played to a musical soundtrack. So let's say that you have your students learning about the Roman Empire. And so they're writing an essay, but they're also going to create an audio recording of it. And then the background music should be musical music from that era as well not just their favorite song of today. So every single facet of what they're creating, they're having to think and put a lot more creativity to within what they're actually making. And so if you don't have technology, that means that you don't have a lesson. That's kind of what you're getting at with modification. And it's not that you're relying on the technology, it's that, that you're embedding the technology and integrating it in a way that enhances your lesson to provide so many different learning modalities for your students. And then finally, we get into the redefinition. So like we talked about earlier, technology allows for the creation of new tasks that were previously inconceivable. So they could not be done without the technology. The work requires students to create new thoughts, new ideas, new understandings. Um, and then these projects are created and shared. So students have a regular um, voice learning culture. They record videos, they record podcasts, they create games. These are all things that are gonna require them to think critically, be creative, co work collaboratively, communicate with one another. They're gonna hit on those four C's. And then, like we said earlier, that this is something that could not be done without the tech. And so here, learning, expands beyond the classroom. So this is where you get into maybe they're collaborating with students from another classroom or students from another site or even students from a different state or something. Um, they ask questions, they research questions. The tech supports the learning and are part of the class voice and the student's voice in their projects and in their work that they're doing. So it's really, really integrating, really enhancing that lesson that you're working on in your classroom. So now let's look at some examples the whole way through. So if we look at an ELA class who's reading a Shakespeare play, that's no technology, they've got a pamphlet in front of them. Substitution would be you're taking that play and they're now just reading it online. So that's using our online textbooks and we're reading. That's just basic substitution. But augmentation is the students are able to use the online dictionaries, study guides, and history sites to kind of supplement their reading. So you see that there's the interactive text component 
within using the computer. Then we step it up and now we're in that transformation stage of modification. So modification, students use multimedia resources with text, audio, video, and all those tools to jointly construct their understanding. So let's say that they're reading a small section of a Shakespeare play and now they have to build their understanding. So use audio and video clips, use pictures, and they have to now build what they're understanding from that snippet of the Shakespeare play. That way you can visually see their thought process and their understanding. Redefinition is students are now taking that thinking onto themselves. They're taking in all of those questions. So students are posing those questions and they can create a mind map that answers those questions through words, images, video, audio created by them or found online. So they could record themselves and put that in it. They could have in the middle of the mind map, you know, that um, little snippet of the Shakespeare play and then they could be dissecting it. This is what it's talking about here. This is what this language is saying. This is what happened before. This is what I think will happen next. And so now they're kind of creating something that was just essentially 2D reading and you're creating something that they're able to show their thinking, their creativity, all of that in one project. Here's, <clears throat> excuse me, here's another example. Um, we're going to walk you through the stages. So no technology, high school math class, um, they complete worksheets on graphing functions. So a substitution would be worksheets are available via a PDF or some type of online format. So nothing is functionally changing, it's just now being offered online. Um, augmentation, so now students are going to complete questions on a Google form providing direct feedback and intervention embedded within the form. So depending on how they answered their question, it might take them to a particular question that's either going to maybe provide them some, some intervention, it's gonna provide them some feedback, maybe it's gonna push them to a more, um, a more, what's the word I'm looking for? Like enhancement or something that's going to kind of push them a little farther um, on, their, on the skill that they're working on. Uh, next, we can move into modification. So students work in groups to investigate and analyze different characteristics and steps on how to graph functions, and then they upload a video. So this is something that could not be done without the tech. It's taking it up an extra step. It's just slowly starting to integrate those four C's in which we're going to talk about in a minute. And then we get to the redefinition section where students create an online portfolio are all types of functions and their graphs could be included, could, they could include real world applications that are modeled by the functions and videos or audios of themselves are uploaded explaining each type of function. So it's really getting into showing what they know, um, they're able to show their understanding, they're able to show it to you instead of just writing down some numbers on a piece of paper, they're able to show it to you whether it be audio, video, if they want to create some type of visual, something like that. So the tech is really there to enhance the learning, enhance the lesson, and it's integrated. Notice that this, these examples that we've talked about, we, we haven't mentioned any type of tech tool. We haven't mentioned anything specific. We just talked about things that they can do. So it's not focused around the tech, it's focused around the lesson and the learning. Yep. And here's a history example. So in history, students read a few core texts and they write a summary. Substitution would just be the book is in the digital format for reading and the students type out a story. So they're just typing it out. They're explaining, they're typing out their summary for what happened or they're explaining what happened in a certain period of time. Augmentation would be students are now creating these digital maps and timelines which are linked to other online resources and videos and students include kind of a written explanation within what they're creating. So they're kind of pulling research from other places. Modification. Now we're taking it a step up and we're getting into that transformation type thinking. So modification, you can have students working in groups. They could be collaborating or you could have them by themselves. But each of the students work on a project from a different perspective. So now you really get into the nitty gritty of history. Well, this is one person's perspective, but what about everybody else who is there? How are their perspectives kind of going on? It could be a video. They could create an audio diary. They could do a blog. And all the students are gonna connect their perspectives to the major topic as a class. That way you could sit here and you could divide out those perspectives and you're getting a much bigger, richer picture of what is going on for these students. And then redefinition, 
students are going to gather information from all the different perspectives themselves. And then they can create a digital storytelling piece. They could include images, audio, video, have a musical score from that time era. They could have, they can make each piece kind of relate to their understanding of the historical topic. So where modification was that kind of jigsaw method, but that technology jigsaw method, redefinition is where you're giving it all back to the student. So that could even be something that after the modification of where the students are jigsawing, now they're gonna create their own piece where they're including all the perspectives and their overall understanding of that time period. And then here is some more examples and just kind of walking you through substitution, augmentation, modification, redefinition. And so this, the first one would be what it looks like with no tech and then the slow tech integration. So these are, like I said, just some examples. And so for example, write and draw a poster about me. So you give them a piece of paper, they're going to write and draw a poster about themselves. Substitution could be print pictures from online and type out their essay. Um, augmentation could be they can make a digital poster and an essay. Modification could be they could record audio video explaining what they have on their Google drawing poster. And then the redefinition could be that they make a book with pictures and sentences explaining about each fact about themselves in something maybe like a Google slide. And so these are just some more examples or a written test. Google form, just a substitution could be a Google form assessment. If you wanted to augment that, they could have the Google form assessment with intervention and feedback built into it. So depending on how they're answering that question, it's going to take them to a particular question, providing them some intervention or some feedback. And it's already pre-built into the quiz. Uh, modification. Students create an answer to the questions in a Google form and they upload their responses. So whether that be audio, pictures, etc. And then redefinitions. Students create a movie or a book or an audio project explaining the essential standards that that test was covering, and they put that into some type of online portfolio. So these are just some examples of projects and tasks and assignments that you could be doing and what it would look like in each stage of the SAMR model. And then here's more examples. So if those weren't enough, we included even more. So using a globe to find a location or doing a presentation to a class, writing a story, reading a story. We've included how you can slowly advance through the SAMR model to get your students asking those questions, to get their creativity rolling, to really be able to enhance the learning that's happening in the classroom. That way students are receiving the information and they're learning it as well. And then when we are talking about these different stages of the SAMR model. Um, every lesson you do is not going to be a redefinition lesson because you're going to exhaust yourself, you're going to exhaust your students, and sometimes a lesson doesn't necessarily need to be a redefinition lesson. Maybe it is okay to just do typing a story because that's what you need them to do. You need them to type, you need them to work on their keyboarding skills. Like there are times where a substitution lesson is 100% perfectly okay. There's times where, okay, maybe instead of doing a substitution, let's try bumping it up to an augmentation or a modification or something. But so I, we don't want you to think that every lesson you do has to be a redefinition. Everyone's going to start in a different place. So everyone might be comfortable with, you know what, I'm going to start off doing substitution lessons just because I want to get comfortable integrating tech into my lessons. And then after you're getting comfortable with it, then you slowly start dipping your toes into the other parts of the SAMR model. We do not expect everyone to just be like, okay, now we're going to do 100% redefinition lessons from here on out, which we know that's not feasible. So we just want to kind of show you how you can take a lesson and what it would look like in each kind of portion of the SAMR model, just to kind of give you an idea, because we could sit there and say, oh, you need to enhance the lesson and you need to do this and you need to do that. But it's also nice to look at as, okay, writing a story. That's something that we all know how to teach. We all know how to do that. We've taught lessons on writing stories. And so here's what it would look like in each stage of the SAMR model. We've all read stories before. What is it going to look like in each stage? Just so we kind of get that mental visual of 
this is what it's going to look like as we progress through the SAMR model. And then here is an example of a SAMR student choice matrix. So what this is, is it has the, the different um, rungs of the SAMR model. So substitution, augmentation, modification, and redefinition. And then it has a particular tool that could be used in that particular section of the SAMR model. And then it's going to show you what that would look like. So if you clicked on it, it would, it's going to take you to like a student example. So you could see at the augmentation portion of the SAMR model and you clicked on the Google Drawings logo, it's going to show you what an example, what that might look like. So these are kind of just to kind of show you what tools could be used. And just because a tool is in the substitution section doesn't mean that it's a substitution tool. It could be used in other ones as well. But these are just kind of to show you this is what it could look like at each kind of stage of the SAMR model. Yeah. And this is also like depending on what you use them for, not just the tool itself. So even if you use class like Google Classroom, that could still be substitution. Mm -hmm. It just kind of depends on how you are using it. So there's like, if you click on this, it'll actually take you to a Google draw of this entire thing where you'll be able to click and open everything up. So this is linked in your copy of the presentation as well. And then now we're gonna kind of look at the SAMR model and Bloom's taxonomy. So Bloom's taxonomy actually integrates really nicely into the SAMR model. And so you're gonna be targeting that higher order cognitive skills throughout the integration of technology. And this increases the learning level and the student outcomes. And you'll see that augmentation, modification, they overlap with the Bloom's taxonomy. Because in every lesson that you create, it's not going to be only augmentation. You're going to have augmentation, a little bit of substitution, a little bit of modification. So you're weaving all of these in into one little lesson. Because that's what we need to do for our students. That's how we learn. We can't jump to the end and expect them to know all the ins betweens. So we have to kind of build up to that. Once you get into that modification redefinition, it's all transformation. So even if your lesson is just modification and you're like, okay, I'm redesigning it. My students are kind of jigsawing in a group using the technology. That's perfect. They're critically thinking. They're being creative. That's all you need to do. And then when you kind of look at the Bloom's taxonomy with it, like, am I targeting these higher order cognitive skills? Are they analyzing? Are they evaluating? Are they applying? Did they understand it? So if they didn't analyze, they couldn't apply, they couldn't evaluate, then you need to take a step back and say, okay, did they understand it? Did they remember what I needed them to? Did I give them the tools to be able to understand and remember? So then that also gives you the ability as a teacher to kind of evaluate yourself, step back, and if you need to, reteach. We do it all day long. As a secondary teacher, I reteach second period. First period comes along and bless their hearts, I try everything on them the first time. And then second period comes and I'm a much better teacher because that's just how it is. And you're constantly reteaching, you're constantly self-evaluating yourself and changing as you go. And so with the SAMR model and Bloom's taxonomy, they really meld well together that you can really get into, am I getting that transformation? Did I give my students enough knowledge to get there the first time? So that's something that you can definitely look at on how to integrate. And then just a recap of things that we've talked about so far. So the SAMR model is a way for teachers to integrate meaningful technology use in their classrooms to enhance the critical thinking of their students. There's four steps. It's an upward ladder. And the goal is to move up the ladder using technology as a tool to support the learning in the classroom. And then always when you're looking to, you know, integrate tech and things, plan the lesson first, then think about how technology can enhance it. Like we said earlier, when we were showing you all those examples, we didn't mention any specific tech tool. We didn't start with the tech tool. We started with the lesson. We started with the concept. We started with those key standards. So you're going to plan like you normally plan. You're going to focus on those key standards. And then when you're planning your lesson, you're going to plan your lesson. And then you're going to think, okay, how can technology enhance this? How can technology help my students be more creative? How can it embed you know, critically, critical thinking and collaboration, stuff like that, and then use the technology to enhance the lesson. And if you're not sure, you're like, this is a lesson I want to do, but I don't know where to start. That's where, that's where Sitara and I come in and we come in and we can help and we can help you 
integrate tech into those lessons. So please make sure and reach out if that's something that you are kind of struggling with. And at first it's, it's kind of hard because you're like, Hey, this is what I want to do, but I don't know how to necessarily do it. But that's, that's what we're here for. We're here to support you in that. Okay. So now we're going to look at the four C's and the four C's are these 21st century skills, which are essential and important to build a student's to build into a student's regular education. So the four C's are critical thinking, creativity, collaboration, and communication. And these four C's can be enhanced when using technology strategically. And if you were listening when we were going over all of those different examples, Marshall and I kept saying critical thinking here, creativity here, the students are collaborating, they're communicating together. So we as teachers, we embed the four C's normally into our normal lesson planning. But now we're going to kind of get into, okay, well, why are they here? What do we do with them? How do we embed them? How do we integrate them more in order to enhance these lessons that we've already planned? So looking at our 21st century student outcomes and support systems here. So we have kind of this, this umbrella here of these different things that they're going to be kind of different outcomes for them. So back in like the early 2000s, um, there was this 21st century skills. These educators came together and they created this framework for 21st century learning. And this is a framework presented um, holistically through the 21st century teaching and learning. And within this, there is core knowledge and there is sub and subject excuse me, there's core knowledge and subject instruction. So students must learn the four C's, which are critically thinking, communication, collaboration, and creativity. And these are essential skills for students, which they will need in their work and in their life after they get out of school. So if you think about how we work as professionals, we work outside of our classrooms, we do those things. We have to think critically, we have to communicate, we have to collaborate, and we have to be creative. So these are things that they're going to need outside of school once they graduate and once they get out into the quote unquote real world. And so digital tools can help build these skills in students. So we can use a variety of digital tools as we've integrated them within our lessons for our students to be creative, critical thinkers. They can collaborate and communicate because these policy leaders and educators and business professionals that came together that came up with these 21st century skills, they said that these are the four things that they need in order to be successful in life and outside of school. And we do this all the time. So how can we definitely make sure that we integrate these? And so we're going to talk about each and every one of these and how to make sure that we're integrating them within our tech tools. All right. So first thing we're going to talk about is we're going to talk about critical thinking. And that is the ability to analyze, interpret, evaluate, make decisions, solve problems. So when we are doing a lesson and we're integrating those tech tools, how can we integrate a tech tool that's going to help them analyze something that we're looking at or something that we're asking them to analyze? How can we have that tech tool help them evaluate what they're working on? How's it going to help them make decisions? How's it going to help them solve the problem that you're wanting them to solve? So when you are having them work on a project and use specific tech tools, I want you to be thinking about how can I have them be critically thinking throughout this lesson, throughout this process, and what are some tech tools that I can integrate to kind of help them be critical thinkers and be critically thinking throughout that lesson? And then creativity. So creativity just is that those abilities like brainstorming, refining ideas, being responsive to ideas from others, and then making those ideas tangible and useful to others. So when we're looking at all these tech tools or what we're having our students do in class, well, how can we allow them to brainstorm? How can we have them refine their ideas? How can we make sure that they're planning these tangible ideas and what can I use to integrate to make this happen. So it could be where, you know what, maybe they're really good at brainstorming on paper. And so you just let them keep brainstorming on paper. But then you're like, well, maybe next time I'll try having them brainstorm on a Google Draw and they'll invite others to it. 
So they're all brainstorming, they're putting pictures, they're pulling different ideas from other places, and then they're expanding what they're brainstorming. So they're coming up with more and more ideas. They're also being responsive to others' ideas. And this is very, very important. So if someone else comes up with an idea, they're not just shutting it down. They're accepting of it, they're responding to it, they're building off of it, which is very important for all of us to do now in school and later. And then we get into collaboration. So this is where they're gonna be working with others to work towards a common goal. It's gonna teach them to be flexible. It's going to teach them to have shared responsibility over a project or something that they're working on. And ultimately it's gonna teach them to work together on something. So maybe they work well um, working collaboratively in person and you start them off working collaboratively in groups and they're working on things physically together. And then using tech, you can use this to kind of enhance collaboration. So maybe you're doing a, you know, I'm a former fourth grade teacher, so maybe we're doing a mission report, but instead of them working on it in isolation by themselves, maybe they start working on it collaboratively in groups in your class. Or maybe you work together as a fourth grade PLC and you start having students work together in the different classrooms. So I'm working on a project with a student from a different fourth grade class at my school. So you're kind of expanding how the collaboration is being done. Maybe they're doing it through Google Slides, maybe they're doing it through Google Docs, maybe they're doing it through Google Drawings or something, but they're working together collaboratively. And then they're going to get that sense of, okay, we're working on this thing together, we're working towards a common goal. I'm gonna have to be flexible because maybe I wanted to do this particular part, but this person wants to do that particular part because that's kind of their strength. So then I'm gonna to have to kind of alter what I'm doing. And then it's giving them shared responsibility because they're working on a project together and it's, it's everyone's kind of responsibility to get the project done. And then it's gonna, it's gonna ultimately help them work together and work um, with others on a particular project. And then communication. So this is students' ability to share information while expressing their thoughts and opinions clearly to others. This also requires strong listening skills, evaluation skills, in order to aid in the collaboration. Students need verbal, written, and multimedia message skills. So this is where we're teaching them how to communicate with each other, how to use their words instead of their actions, how that even if you're writing something, you still need to follow the same guidelines of when you're speaking out loud. So this gets into communication at all different levels, which also builds into the collaboration that Marshall just talked about. Because especially at that secondary level, these kids, they don't want to collaborate. They don't want to communicate clearly. They don't want to communicate anything. And so making sure that when they're communicating, that they're communicating what they're supposed to be doing by teaching these skills. Because their students don't know these skills. They don't know how to have those proper listening skills. They don't know how to express their ideas clearly or why it's important. They're not born with these innate skills. It's something that we as adults, we've learned throughout the years of how to communicate and how to express our thoughts. And so now we need to teach this to our students. That way when they're in groups or when they're just talking to us, we're able to understand what they want and what they need and their ideas. And then once they're able to communicate those ideas, then they can make it something tangible. Then they can write about it. They can be creative with it, then they can critically think and take it farther and farther. So all of these four skills just kind of build right on top of each other. And you'll notice too that it's going to be really hard to just focus on one C. Like, okay, I want them to communicate, but then you'll you'll notice that inevitably it's going to pull in collaboration. It's going to pull in critical thinking. It's going to be pulling in creativity. So when you're working on something, you'll it's, it's going to be hard to just say, okay, I just want them to focus on communication. Like they're all the other C's are going to be, are going to be filing in as well. So you'll, you'll notice that you'll be, you know, designing your lesson, designing your, your tech integration, designing your 4C integration. And it's going to be really hard to just focus on one of the C's. They're, they're all going to be um, being integrated um, when you're, when you're creating your, your lessons and stuff. And so here are some kind of uh, ideas and some examples of what these might look like. So critical thinking, so history. Students compare fossil fuels consumption in the past and in the present. They organize findings throughout a graphic organizer. They compare and contrast data 
et cetera. So this could be something that they're doing and they're having to critically think about the data that they are organizing and that they are comparing and contrasting. When they're being creative, they're brainstorming ways to address recycling and make service announcement videos to play at assembly. So they are creating something. They are being creative. They're using that creative part of their brain and they are making something to um, address a particular topic that you are having them address in their, in their lesson. Uh, collaboration. So this could be, you know, science can work with other classes to investigate local and environmental issues. And each team has separate roles. So they each have a specific role in the task. So they're going to have to work together to get that collective task completed. And then communication, maybe they're focusing on forest fires and they're going to have to engage with the fire chief in video or online conferences. They're going to have to share the voice in class. So they're going to have to talk about it in class and they're going to work in groups and communicate their ideas that they were coming up with to try to address forest fires. So these are just some kind of examples of ways that each of the four C's could look in a particular lesson. And then when you looked at those, you should have noticed that, oh, well, they're all overlapping still. Even though like we separated them out into little columns, they're all overlapping. You can draw arrows everywhere and mm -hmm. see how, well, in the communication, they're also collaborating and aren't they being creative and critical thinking? And in the creativity where they're brainstorming, well, they're making a video. So aren't they collaborating with others and they're communicating through that video they're making? So it's all overlapping, yes. But that overarching goal is what you can focus on and all the four C's are gonna be within that. So it's definitely something that we need to teach our kids how to communicate, how to collaborate, how to be those creative thinkers. And just to give you a little recap, so the four C's are based on the 21st century skills framework. They are critical thinking, communication, collaboration, and creativity. And each of these skills can be enhanced, can be enhanced through the use of technology when planned strategically. So going back to that SAMR model, we're planning our lesson, we're thinking about how we're going to integrate the tech, how that tech can enhance our lesson. But then now we're thinking about two okay, how can I also integrate the four C's into my lesson and have those four C's also enhance my lesson as well as the technology enhancing the lesson. And then so some resources that we've included here on the resource page, uh, there's a hyperdoc, which we talked about last week. There's a hyperdoc with SAMR models um, with examples. So you can go through that. You can click through those different examples and look at them. We also have the SAMR student choice matrix so it just gives you an overview of different apps. But remember, using the app doesn't make doesn't mean that you're going to have the redefinition or modification. It completely depends on how you're using that app. And then we've also included the Educator's Guide to Four Cs. It's a PDF created by the NEA. And so this came out when all of that research on the 21st century skills came out. And this Educator's Guide dives deep into the four Cs and gives you a more in-depth view of them and how to incorporate them in your classroom if you'd like to also read through that. But it's a big PDF, so definitely have some time on your hands or divide it up between a few nights. So now we are going to jump into our Q&A section for this webinar. So the one question that we had was about accessing the um, the YouTube page, but I think we addressed that already. And another question is, I like the idea of students creating an online portfolio. Once students create one or more pieces of work, where do they store it? So it kind of depends on how you how do you how you want to do this, but it can be stored, they could just save it in their Google Drive and then they can be posting it to whatever type of platform you're having them post their work to. So then that way they always have it, it's stored on their drive, but they're just kind of sharing it to a specific platform. So I know like we talked about Wakelet last week and so that could be something that they use that to kind of display their portfolio, but all their work is saved on their, their Google Drive, it's just, for example, Wakelet is the platform that they're using to kind of show off their work, as you could say. Um, so 
their work would be stored in their drive, but then where they're kind of posting it would just kind of depend on whatever platform you're wanting to use. Yeah. And so like if you're using like younger grades, like TK to two, Seesaw, Seesaw has yep. like the notebook feature where the students are just putting those portfolios together. So definitely if you're super younger grades, like I would say like second and under, definitely go to Seesaw. If you're fifth grade and up, especially in like middle school and high school, have your students create a Google site. When they create a Google site, it's just essentially a web page and you can make it private. That way they can only share it via link. And with a Google site, you can upload your PDFs, you can upload your slides, you can upload videos, you can upload audio, you can put anything on the web page that you see in other web pages that are created. And the students can add different tabs for different units, different tabs for projects. They can organize it however they want. And then at the end of the year, they have something that to show for what they've actually done all year. But then when open house comes around, you have something as a teacher that you can be like, look at my student portfolios, look at everything they've done. This is a digital version. And then of course you're going to have your 3D hands-on stuff displaying in your classroom as well. But for that online portfolio, I would definitely for like secondary, stick with those Google sites because it's really nice. It's the templates are really simple for the students to understand. It's also a good skill. It's like a great skill for them to build. And especially when you start getting into your juniors and seniors, they're going to be starting to put together information for their college applications. So if they have everything in one spot already where they're like, oh yeah, I did forget that I volunteered here when I was a sophomore or as a freshman, or, oh, that's right, I did a research all about, you know, X, Y, Z in my ag class. So they have everything in one spot. That way they're able to reference it. But then it also connects to, you know, our real life skills when they're making a CV or a resume or they're applying somewhere else. Um, and then another question was, uh, what is Lexia? So that's my fault. I forgot to actually say what it is. Um, so it is a uh, reading program that kind of focuses on like phonics instruction and gives students independent practice based on their reading levels. So um, originally it was made for elementary. So it was made for like TK five, but now they've added um, a second kind of section to their program. So they've added what's called power up. And so that is geared more towards secondary. So that is actually going to be on Thursday. So tomorrow's PD is going to be focused more on the core five, which is most is focused more on elementary, but then um, uh, power up is focused more on the secondary. And so that'll be on Thursday, but there are some, as, as, as we all know, there are some secondary students that probably do need that core five instruction. So um, just because it's geared towards TK five doesn't mean that it can't um, help and assist older students as well. So that's what Lexi is. It's a reading, computerized reading program that's going to help them with their phonics and reading development. Yeah, which is very much needed. Yeah. All right. As always, if you have any questions that you think of after this, please do not hesitate to reach out to one of us. We are here to help. We're here to support you all. Um, and we just want to thank you for joining us. Thank you for taking time out of your day to learn and grow with us. And um, hopefully we will see you tomorrow and have a good rest of your day and we will talk to you soon. Bye.